Good morning and namaskar ladies and gentlemen. It gives me extreme pleasure standing here interacting with you on a CME that is solely dedicated to radiology and ENT. It really wouldn't be presumptuous on my part if I assume that this is possibly one of the first of its kind and I do sincerely hope not the last. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwar, Guru Sakshat Parabrahma, Tashmai Shri Guru Vedma. Well, in my journey so far, I've been blessed and fortunate enough to have come across a large number of well-meaning friends and teachers. But the one person who's left an indelible stamp on my psyche, on my thought, and who has taught me more than I could have ever imagined, is Professor Mario Sana of Group Autology. And whatever gratitude I express towards him would always fall short. Now, I have been asked to interact with you on the HRCT of the temporal bone from a surgeon's perspective. Whether you are a surgeon, a radiologist or any other clinician, it's extremely important for you that in order to understand the radiology of any particular area, you know the anatomy of that area inside out. It's only once that you master the anatomy of the concerned area that you are able to understand what the anatomical alterations are and hence, what is the probable pathology that is responsible for bringing about that alteration. So, the entire presentation would possibly be divided into these three sections wherein we would discuss a little bit of normal anatomy, a little bit of the anatomical alterations and then of the probable pathologies. Mind you, this is not a didactic lecture wherein I would sort of speak down upon to you and teach you the anatomy of the temporal bone. It's a vast subject. It is just to give you a little food for thought, generate an interest so that you can go back home and possibly follow this as a passion. So, moving on to the normal anatomy. Professor Andre Sultan of France says that there are three ways to learn the anatomy, especially of an, of the, uh, of an area as complex as the temporal bone. And those three ways are temporal bone dissection lab, temporal bone dissection lab, and once again, temporal bone dissection lab. The more time that you spend in the temporal bone dissection lab, the more you become aware of the interpersonal play, if I may use the term instead of relationship, the interpersonal play between these important structures that fortunately or unfortunately for an ear surgeon, God decided to house within the petrous temporal bone. I again would not be presumptuous if I say that if we take a per square inch or per square centimeter density, I think temporal bone is possibly the only part of the human body which is densest as far as critical organs are concerned. Now, moving on to certain basic considerations. Like any other scan, like any other CT or for that matter any other scan, the CT temporal is usually read on two sections. One, the axial and the other is the coronal. And the pivot here is the orbitometer line. While the coronal sections are perpendicular to the orbitometer line, the axial section is parallel to it and that is something we should always remember. We do obviously have these days with the advancement of technology, the advancement of digital technology, we again have the oblique sagittal scans, but in my opinion they have a pretty limited role. There are certain tips that I would put, front in, uh, put for, uh, forth in, uh, in front of you, tips that you could be, take back home and I do hope that they would help you sort of interpret CT scans much better, especially of the temporal bone. First, always try and read scans in a sequence. Picking up scan number 5 and trying sure. to read the anatomy sure. of the temporal bone out of context with the previous and the subsequent scan can always land you in trouble. I mean, it could land you in trouble once in a while. So it's always preferred that you read the scans in a sequential fashion. Say, for example, if, if it be the actual scans, you can always read them in a superior to inferior manner. And if it's a coronal scan, you could go about interpreting them in an anterior to posterior or posterior to anterior fashion. My personal opinion, as far as actual cuts are concerned, try doing it superior to inferior because, again, the density of the vital structures is least in the superior cuts and it sort of increases as you go down. So as you become familiar with the anatomy of the patient as far as his or her temporal bone is concerned, it becomes easier to identify structures. As far as coronal scans are concerned, try doing it posterior to anterior for a similar reason. Next. Any structure that is parallel to the section would appear in its entirety or as a tubular structure 
whereas any structure that is perpendicular to the scan, to the axis of the scan, would appear circular. Now let me make this point a little more clear with you with some examples. The horizontal internal carotid artery, as we all know, is housed in the petrous temporal bone, right? Now, the horizontal temporal, uh, internal carotid artery is parallel to the actual scan. And hence, on the left-sided sc scan, you see the entire horizontal internal carotid artery. Whereas the same horizontal internal carotid artery on the right side, that is on the coronal section, appears circular because it is moving perpendicular to the axis of the scan. Or for that matter, if we take the vertical part of the facial nerve, the mastoid segment, now the vertical part of the facial nerve is parallel to the coronal sections and hence appears in its entirety in the left scan, whereas the same structure becomes circular when you move on to an actual scan. Identifying the ossicles at times can be a little bit of a problem, but if you follow a very, very, especially on coronal sections, but if you follow a very simple philosophy, there are chances that your margin of error would reduce. Now, there are two main structures that we tend to get confused with, and that is the body of the incus and the head of the malleus, right? When they are housed in the epitympanic area or the attic area. Draw an axis along the, uh, draw a longitudinal axis along the ossicle, and what you would find is that the long axis of the body of the incus is obliquely oriented in a coronal section, whereas the long axis of the head of the malleus is longitudinally or vertically oriented. The malleus would never be obliquely oriented in a coronal section unless you've positioned your patient improperly. If you see a bilobed structure, it's neither the incus nor the malleus. It's a combination of the two, and that is the incudomaleolar joint, which you see there. The bilobed structure, the posterior superior part, is formed by the body of the incus, whereas the anterior inferior part is being formed by the head of the malleus. Moving on to the actual scans as far as the ossicle is concerned, most of the radiologists are aware of this term called the ice cream cone appearance of the incudomaleolar joint in the attic. While the circular, anterior circular shadow is formed by the head of the malleus, it's basically a bird's eye view. In fact, all actual scans are bird's eye view. You're sort of looking down upon the body or looking up along the body. So the anterior circular shadow is being formed by the body of the, uh, the head of the malleus, whereas the posterior triangular conical appearance is because of the body and the short process of the incus. Again, the classical uh, appearance on an oblique scan, that's an oblique sagittal scan, and uh, this is called the molar tooth configuration of the incudomaleolar joint. The anterior shadow that you see is the head of the malleus and the uh, handle of the malleus, whereas the posterior shadow or the shadow on the right that you see is the body, the short process and in the, the long process of the incus. So it's like a double root molar tooth and this is called the classical molar tooth configuration of the incudomaleolar joint on an oblique sagittal scan. As far as otologists are concerned, we are especially bothered about the sinus tympani. How deep is the sinus tympani? Whether the facial nerve, or rather whether the pathology is extending into the, uh, into the sinus tympani. And since the facial nerve forms an important border of the sinus tympani, how much of a bone can I drill over the facial nerve before I can really identify or reach the depths of the sinus tympani? And that is better visualized on an actual scan. The yellow arrow that you see is the facial recess. I prefer to call this the sleeping W sign. So it's a sleeping W sign. Now, the two Vs that form the W, the lateral part, so it's, it's kind of a sleeping W if you see properly. This, the vertical limb, that's the, uh, the pyramid, and that's the uh, other vertical limb of the W. So this is the bony annulus, the tympanic, uh, bony tympanic annulus. That's the vertical segment of the uh, facial nerve and that's the sinus tympani, whereas this is the facial recess. So this another is another area which an otologist or a radiologist would be concerned about because if you have a sinus tympani, which can be the case in a, I mean, which can be the scenario in a large number of cases, if the sinus tympani is a pretty deeply extending sinus tympani, remember there's only a certain amount of bone that you can remove. And hence, you might have to figure out a different way of approaching a patient who has a cholesteatoma extending deeper into the sinus tympani. That was a little bit about uh, the anatomy. Obviously, we cannot cover the entire anatomy. I haven't spoken to you about the inner ear and so on and so forth. But now let's quickly take a look at a little bit of anatomical alterations that we could encounter in our day-to-day -day practice. 
Right now, we have seen the classical ice cream cone appearance of the incudomeliola joint as the normal anatomy in the attic area. Now, what we can see is the incus and the malleus, they seem to be intact, but then the, sim the, the, the symbiosis or the joint between them is missing. And as we can see, there is a little bit of soft tissue which is uh, present on the lateral aspect of the epitympanic or the attic area. So that is one sign that you have wherein you have the sort of disruption of the ice cream cone appearance of the incudomeliolar joint. And uh, that should uh, uh, give an inkling to the radiologist or to the otologist as to whether an ossicular plasty or any kind of an ossicular uh, reconstruction would be required in this particular patient. The tegmen. Now the tegmen is, tegmen is the bony plate, whether it be the tegmen antri or the tegmen tympani. The tegmen is the bony plate which forms the roof of the mastoid bone. When it is over the antrum, we call it the tegmen antri, and when it's over the middle ear or the attic area, rather, it's called the tegmen tympani. Now, an important complication, as we all know, of cholesteatoma, uh, of the pathology of cholesteatoma, is intracranial complication. And one very important finding, as far as CT scan is concerned, is the erosion. As you can see over here, the tegmen is intact. That the, that's the head of the malleus. That's the scutum. Those are the turns of the cochlea and the parts of the facial nerve. But very clearly, you see in a comparative picture that the tegmen is totally missing and there's a soft tissue which not only extends into the attic area but probably is in close contact with the middle cranial fossa. Again, the sinus plate, the sigmoid sinus lies or the lateral sinus is right behind the sig uh, sinus plate in the uh, uh, petrous part of, or the mastoid part of the temporal bone and any break in this particular bone over on the sinus area, that's the sinus plate area, any break in this particular area should always, should always warn the radiologist and the otologist about the probability of having an intracranial complication either in the form of a lateral sinus thrombosis or a perisinus abscess or for that matter even a cerebellar abscess. That's the MRI which confirms the fact, that's the pathology which is seen in the middle area and middle ear and the mastoid area. And that is the hyper intense signal that you see within the sigmoid sinus which suggests that there is a sigmoid sinus or rather a lateral sinus thrombosis. Now, patient presents with dizziness. Clinically, you are quite sure that there is cholesteatoma. But then if the patient has dizziness, you need to know what the reason behind that dizziness is. And as far as the ear is concerned, the first thought that comes to our mind as far as cholesteatoma is concerned is whether the patient is harboring any fistula or not. Now again, going back to the actual view, normal scan, the incudomelular joint and a classical ice cream cone appearance. And that's the dense compact bone over the lateral semicircular canal. That is the lateral semicircular canal. And the white bone that you see is the dense ivory compact bone over the lateral semicircular canal. Now. If you see a dimpling over the bone, over the lateral semicircular canal, your antennae should get raised. Whether it be valvasori, whether it be Schwartz, whether it be Somme and Curtin, dimpling over the bone that covers or rather houses the labyrinth, please, please, please be very, very careful as to whether you are dealing with a lateral, sinus, a lateral uh, semicircular canal uh, fistula, which is much clearer now. Now that is a frank fistula of the lateral semicircular canal. Again, if you do a comparative uh, study, you find that the dense ivory bone over here is intact, whereas there is a through and through erosion of the bone over the lateral semicircular canal. Now again, according to Somen Curtin and Valvasori, if you find if you find a fistulous communication uh, between the pathology and the semicircular canal on one cut, the chances are that there is a probable fistula. If you find it on two consecutive cuts, the probability increases. But if you find it on three subsequent, uh, I mean, co consecutive cuts, you can be rest assured that there is a fistulous communication between the pathology and the semicircular canal. So it is extremely important that HRCTs of temporal bone are true HRCTs and not just for the sake of doing HRCTs, you know. True HRCTs are meant to be one millimeter cuts. If you have a five millimeter cut in the name of an HRCT, your lateral semicircular canal is over and done with. You can never ever appreciate the fact that you have a fistulous communication on three consecutive scans. So that is something you have to be very, very particular about.
the same uh, fistula being visible on a coronal section. Again, that's the lateral semicircular canal, that's the vestibule, that's the basal turn of the cochlea, that's the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, and as you can see, the bone over the uh, lateral semicircular canal is pretty intact, whereas again, the pathology over here has eroded the bone and has made a fistulous communication between the uh, pathology and the lateral semicircular canal. Now, take a look at this slide properly, and then concentrate on the next slide. The difference that you see here and in the previous slide is the fact that if you look at the shadow within the vestibule or within the labyrinth, you find it to be an iso-intense shadow. Are we clear on that? Am I correct? But if you look at this particular slide, what you find is, I'm not sure whether you're able to appreciate because of the contrast or not, but there's an iso-intense shadow here and here which means that not only is there a fistulous communication, but there's a pneumal labyrinth. Now, what is your option, or rather, how do you interpret that? If there is only a fistulous communication between the pathology and the bony semicircular canal, then you, might, you usually don't land up with a pneumal labyrinth because the membranous labyrinth is still intact. But a pneumal labyrinth within the semicircular canal would possibly give you an idea that there is a fistulous communication which is involving the membranous labyrinth also, or in other words, the membranous labyrinth is also open to external air. And so, if you encounter a numerous la pneumal labyrinth, your prognosis as far as hearing is concerned goes down. Obviously, this patient would be having some kind of a sensory neural hearing loss, but then you have to keep this in mind while counseling the patient as well as while planning your surgery. Okay, that's uh, the, the fistulous communication between another semicircular canal. That's the superior semicircular canal which you see here on a normal coronal section, whereas you can very clearly see that this pathology here has not only eroded the tegmen, but it has moved on and created a communication with the superior semicircular canal as well. So while lateral semicircular canal fistulae are more common in day-to-day -day practice, don't don't sort of limit yourself to the fact that there can only be a communication with the lateral canal because it's the lateral most or the outermost structure. That's one of my favorite slides. That's the basal, the, the two or the two and a half turns of cochlea very clearly visible on a coronal section, normal coronal section. And the, that's a petrous bone cholesteatoma which has eroded into the base of the uh, basal turn of the cochlea. Again, with this kind of an appearance on a scan, you really need to figure out whether you would be going in for a routine mastoid surgery or would you think of a petrosectomy with a cul-de-sac closure in case the patient has, has totally or more or less having a uh, severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss. Right. Our friend or foe in the temporal bone area, and that is the facial nerve. The moment we open the, pa the patient till the moment the patient is back from anesthesia, the only, the main area of concern is, boss, facial nerve, cheek, hai na? I hope I have not messed up with the facial nerve. So it's extremely important that we understand the anatomy of the facial nerve and we visualize it beforehand in the scans in order to know whether I should tread, obviously you need to tread carefully and we all have this dictum that the tympanic segment of the facial nerve is always dehiscent unless proven otherwise. And this is exactly what the scan shows. Now both are pathological scans and have been put here in order to help you appreciate the difference much better. As you can see, that's the tympanic segment of the facial nerve and that's the labyrinthine segment. And in spite of the pathology here, the bony covering over the tympanic segment of the facial nerve is pretty well intact. Whereas on the co contemporary scan, what you see is, though the pathology is very, very limited, the operculum or the covering over the tympanic segment of the facial nerve is gone. So it's not necessarily true that the extent of the pathology would always decide whether the facial nerve would be dehiscent or not. Again, as is the dictum, if you have epitympanic attic cholesteatoma, always assume or presume that the facial nerve tympanic segment is dehiscent. Right. Of, we do often very, I mean, have uh, failures of our cavities, especially canal wall down or, for that matter, even canal wall up. And so, CT scan provides us with a, with a, with a decent idea as to whether my, the cavity that I had created, and if the patient is not having a dry ear, whether the cavity that I have created is a 
good cavity or a bad cavity. As you can see here, that's a, a, an ideal example of a good cavity. There is no bony overhang here. There's a wide concom meatoplasty, and the facial ridge has been lowered down to the, to the maximum possible extent. Whereas this is a classical example of a poor cavity. It's a narrow meatoplasty, there's a bony ledge, then look at the amount of bone that has still been left behind over the vertical part of the facial nerve, and hence leading to this sump effect. Again, you've done a mastoid, possibly a canal wall up mastoid, and you've put in a prosthesis, patient loses his hearing. You can always take the help of an HRCT to understand or to, to sort of analyze whether your prosthesis is in place or not. As you can see in this particular scan, that's an old-fashioned uh, Teflon prosthesis, pop torp, which has come out of its area along with some cholesterol granuloma. Canalplasty forms a very important part of our surgery, whether it's a tympanoplasty or a mastoid surgery, but what we have to realize is the, the, the thinness of the tympanic bone, especially anteriorly, and its close proximity to the temporomandibular joint. If you drill the uh, tympanic bone to a large extent, you always have the chance of opening up the temporomandibular joint, which can A, lead to a temporomandibular joint arthritis in the long run, and two, because of repeated jaw movement, Epidermis can get pinched into that sac and it can lead to an iatrogenic cholesterol. So always take a look at the thinness or the thickness of the tympanic bone when you're taking a look at the uh, HRCT of the temporal bone. So that is the iatrogenic cholesterol which the patient developed after undergoing a type 1 tympanoplasty with canalplasty. The burning issue, canal wall up or canal wall down, I don't need to get into that debate. But obviously for a canal wall up, besides second look surgery, we need to figure out a way wherein we can sort of understand whether uh, by scan, whether CT or MR, we do have a short discussion on that in the later part of this presentation, whether the CT or the MR can give us an idea about the recurrence. This obviously is a gross case of recurrence. That's the intact external auditory canal wall, and as you can see, there is formation of some kind of a soft tissue. Why I use the term some kind would get evident in the later part of the presentation. Piston failure, patient, you've done a stapy surgery, and the patient says, Dr. Saab, acha sun rahe the, achanak se chakar aa rahe, kam sun rahe hai. There's a movement, uh, there's a move, uh, component with movement, and you do an HRCT, and uh, you find the prosthesis. Uh, the, the piston out of its place. Obviously, the, uh, the shadow here is hyper intense because it's a fish prosthesis wherein the lower part is intentionally made a little radio opaque for us to understand the uh, piston better. Finally, the last part of the discussion, and that is the pathology. Now, the biggest disadvantage of CT is the poor soft tissue and neurovascular differentiation, irrespective of which area you're dealing with. Now, as an otologist, when you are asking for an HRCT, especially if in a revision case, the things that you wish to see is whether there's an inflammatory change, whether there's serious fluid pus, granulation, cholesterol, granuloma, or for that matter, cholesterol. But unfortunately, there is no differentiation, and they all appear similar, and that is an iso-intense shadow. So how do we go about it? Especially, in, uh, as I was saying, it, it's a burning issue for canal wall up surgery because it's advocated that after a canal wall surgery, you do a second look surgery about 8 to 10 months down the line and possibly even do an ossicular reconstruction. But is there a way by which we can try and avoid this second surgery? CT scan? No. MRI? Maybe. Now that's a patient, that's an uh, operatively proven patient. It's a young girl I had operated upon and I had done a canal wall up surgery. And within seven days of the surgery, the girl had a fall and somehow, for whatever reason, anyway, she basically started having discharge again. And when I got an MRI done, that's a T2 scan, I saw, I saw a kind of a hyper intense shadow. And I explored her again and obviously the cavity was full of cholesteatomatous mass. A few studies have been conducted by Jan Kasselmann of uh, Belgium and his friends, by Nagai and uh, by Stasola. In fact, I had the good fortune of meeting and interacting with Kasselmann when I was in Turkey for the International Cholesterol Conference in 2008. And he is one person who's been really working on the fact that can we design a modality of scanning by which we can sort of pinpoint the fact that yes, this pathology is cholesterol. They made pretty decent progress so far according to their theory. The eco-planner or the non-eco-planner diffusion-weighted images 
if they are performed on a patient where you've done a canal wall up surgery or any other patient where you feel like sort of identifying the, the recurrence or the residual cholesteatoma, you do a non-EP or an EP, preferably a non-EP diffusion-weighted image, and the cholesteatoma lights up on that particular image. It becomes hyper-intense. It's a dirty-looking image because diffusion-weighted images are pretty dirty-looking images, but the cholesteatoma lights up. A lot of studies have been conducted. You put in, you go to PubMed or you sort of go, uh, go to any other of uh, these uh, medical uh, citation sites and you put in Castleman or you put in EPI imaging and cholesteatoma and you will get a number of hits. And it's an interesting theory. In fact, it's more than a theory now. It's being done very, very commonly. But what you have to ensure is that there are no artifacts facts in the external auditory canal because basically that hyper intensity is because of the dead epidermis. So if you have a keratotic uh, lung in the external auditory canal, it would give out the same signals. Finally, last part of the discussion. CP angle tumors, internal auditory canal uh, tumors or SOLs, is CT mandatory? In my opinion, yes. And the next few, few slides would prove that to you. That's a CT scan of a patient. No point getting into the history. Absolutely normal CT. But look at the size of the vestibular schwannoma the patient is harboring. Second example, CT scan of another patient, the only abnormality that you see is that the sigmoid sinus is a little bulky, maybe because of hyperdynamic circulation, maybe because of anatomical alteration, but look at the kind of uh, CP angle tumor she is harboring. Third example, this patient presented to me with a sudden onset sensory neural hearing loss. I, I hope it's pretty uh, clear to uh, everyone here that the sudden onset sensory neural hearing loss on the right side. He had it in the morning. I saw him in the afternoon. His acoustic reflexes were all present. His acoustic reflexes were all present. His bearer, right and left, was more or less normal. There was no delay. There was no increase in the inter-peak uh, latencies. None of that happened. Not only that, I put him on steroids and his hearing started improving. His hearing started improving. In fact, it became uh, sort of similar to the hearing on the left side, and we could always assume this to be the, the remnant or the base, baseline pressed by acoustics that he might be having. But, surprise, surprise, the patient for a change insisted on an MRI, and what we find is a small intracanalicular SOL possibly a vestibular schwannoma, and let me give you the unfortunate news, his tumor now is increasing in size. So, moral of the story, CP angle, or rather sensory neural hearing loss, or for that matter, any inner ear symptom, especially unilateral. Don't do a bera, don't, or rather don't stop at a bera, don't stop at an acoustic reflex, don't stop if the patient recovers his or her hearing. Please ensure that you do an MRI with GAD, and you ensure that uh, you rule out a CP angle tumor. Well, this might be an impossibility in my state, but I do assure, assume, I mean, I would definitely hope that radiologists and ENT specialists can come together and have a much more fruitful association. Just to end it on a much lighter note, two pieces of advice for all married men here. Never laugh at your wife's choices, you're one of them. And never be too proud of your choices, your wife is one of them. And before I end, a very, very heartfelt thanks to all my friends here, to the Bangalore ENT Association, to Raja Rajeshwari Medical College, to Avaya Medicon, and particularly to Deepak Sir. Sir, I'm honored and grateful to have been, uh, to be in contact with you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. The obstacles and the here, both preoperatively and in some other situations as well, uh, because it's a pretty vast topic, imaging of the temporal bones. This particular uh, presenting list that you can see in this presentation belongs to me. None of them have been downloaded from the internet or any form of social media. I thank the ORL journal for allowing me to use the anatomy, gross anatomy pictures that you would see during the presentation. You could have an company gross anatomy picture so that it will help you identify these structures. However, I'd like to, I'd like to make uh, one small point here that for the rest of the structures, the exact correlation might not be available because obviously they are not from the same patient, right? 
So you might find some differences as far as the rest of the structures is concerned. So here I've been tried maintaining the correlation mainly in respect to the ossicles. Now as far as the action scans are concerned, my personal belief is to always read these scans superior to inferior rather than inferior to superior because you see the cluttering of these structures and the sort of uh, dirtiness that you see in the CT scan is more concentrated towards the inferior sections and therefore if you are coming down superior to inferior, you start gradually getting familiar with the structures and hence identification of the more complicated structures in the mesotympanum becomes easy for you. So this is one of the upper more, the most uh, scans where you don't see any possibles, what you definitely see are the two limbs of the superior semicircular canal with faintly the intercum arcuate artery or what is in radiological terms for the petromasoid canal visible in between the two limbs. This is probably the antrum or the upper part of the attic area with the antral air cells all around and you can join the CD4 relationship on the anatomical picture. Now as we move down we start seeing the upper part of the intudomaleolar joint. So that is the head of the malleus. That is the body of the impus which will later start showing the short process of the impus pointing towards the atlas. And you see the intudomaleolar joint again correlated here. Not only that, right anterior to the head of the malleus, you see this bony septum which we all know as the as the cock, right? And in fact, that is very well very correlated here uh, on the uh, gross specimen as well. And you do have a cell anterior to the cock. So, in a way, the scan helps you in uh, understanding the fact that beyond the cock, there could be pathology. And if you take this cock as the end point of your dissection during surgery, you could land into trouble, leaving behind vesicular disease. Anyway, so you see the head of the malleus, the inters and the intudomaleolar joint. As we move down further, the classical appearance, the eye stream cone appearance of the intudomaleolar joint in the attic of the epitympanum area becomes very, very clear. So the anterior part of the eye stream cone appearance is formed by the head of the malleus. And the cone of the so-called eye stream cone appearance is formed by the body of the inters and the short process of the interest again pointing towards the actus ad antrum seen here as well. This is a more gross picture of the interest and the malleus with the intudomaleolar joint and how it would look if you look at it at the intudomaleolar joint from the uh, top deep in the intudomaleolar joint in your hand below you. We move further down. As we move further down, the attic area becomes a little larger, the interior valvular joint becomes a little distorted, right? Again correlated here, and then you, then you start seeing the external auditory canal and this fine piece of bone, which we pathologists know very clear well as the scutum or the lateral attic wall, one of the first areas to be involved in localized cholesteatoma. So, you have the entire intubomaleolar joint. Now from here onwards, I would like you to pay attention to, I just go back to the scan and look at that. What is that structure there? Anyone please? That's the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. Can you see, make that out? That's the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. So this is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. That's the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve. And so this is your genitalic angle. Why is it important to identify? Because as you go lower down, you will find that this area is replaced by another structure, which if you look at it isolated, it would give you the wrong notion that it is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. So right now, in this scan that we were already talking about, you can see the entire tympanic segment of the facial nerve. That's the entire tympanic segment of the facial nerve. Now that you have seen the entire tympanic segment of the facial nerve, you need to understand that as you go lower down, that your facial nerve should not be there where it is visible now. Because from the tympanic segment, it will form the second genu and then the vertical segment. So, this being the tympanic segment of the uh, facial nerve in its almost in its entirety. And as we know, this is, this is the 
lateral semicircular canal, we can see the entire thing of the lateral semicircular canal. We know that it might inferior to the lateral semicircular canal. The tension nerve is going to take a downward turn and get converted into the transverse segment. So that is exactly what is happening in the next scan. Now, if you haven't paid attention to the previous scan, I'm just digressing here a little from the hospitals because this is extremely important. Now, if you haven't paid attention to the previous scans, you might well have mistaken this structure as the facial nerve tympanic segment. But that is not the case. If you follow the structure properly, both on the scan and on the gross segment, you see that the structure comes back, takes a turn at a bulbous structure, becomes thin and goes towards the radius. So this is the tensor tympani muscle, as you can see here. This is the entire tensor tympani muscle going towards the eustachian tube, taking a turn, coming out of the bulbous structure that is the popular form process, and getting converted into the sorry, getting converted into the tensor tympani tendon, and therefore getting attached to the neck of the mantis. So this is extremely important, and so. Where is the facial nerve now? Now the facial nerve has come here. That's the vertical segment of the facial nerve. So now the facial nerve has come here, very well correlated on the, uh, on the gross anatomy, which is this. This is the facial nerve. So this is the handle of the magus, or maybe the junction of the neck and the handle of the magus, however you choose to call it. And now, and we cover the body of the infus. We cover the sharp process of the infus. So now what stays? are at the log process of the impus, correct? So on an action scan, the log process of the impus, because the scan is passing perpendicular to the log axis of the log process of the impus, this thing appears circular. So this is your log process of the impus, this is your handle of the malleus. We are still in the expanding upper part and hence we are not seeing the tympanic membrane completely. But this is the area of the lateral uh, 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 lateral wall of the attic or the scutum, or also known as the Cruzax space. Now, you can see that this is the facial nerve, and if this is where the tympanic anulus would be, so this is the area of the facial recess. Going down further, it makes it very, very clear to you now. But this is one picture you need to put it in your mind as the best possible appearance of a large number of important structures on an actual scan. That's the handle of manus. You can still see the cochlear form process. You can faintly see the tensor tympani tendon. Can you see it on the screen? There's the contrast wall right there. Okay. So that's the tensor tympani tendon going towards the handle of the malleus. Right? That's the short process of the, the long process of the incus gradually getting converted into the denticular process, turning, and not only that, we see the anterior crust, the posterior crust, and the head of the stapes. So this is the area of the incudo stapedal joint. And this sign is called the two parallel lines sign in radiology terms. The anterior parallel line is the cochlearly form process, the tensor tympani tendon and the handle of the magus. And the posterior parallel line is the long natural denticular process of the ingress and the stapedal superstructure. And we can see that the superior superstructure, at the base of the superior superstructure, obviously lies the foot plate of the day, of the stapes, which in turn lies on the vestibule. Not only that, the facial nerve is here. This is your facial nerve here, right? Right? It's housed within, within the pyramidal process. This is your tympanic annulus. So this part now becomes a facial recess, and this part becomes a sinus tympanum. That is why I said that this particular cut is absolutely mandatory when you ask for an HRCT, especially if you're going to the seat of our surgery and you wish to know what the depth of your sinus tympani is, whether it is possible for you to do a blind section, how deep does the soft tissue go inside, so on and so forth. So never ever leave a scan without searching for this particular segment. Same correlation between here, tympanic handless tympanic membrane with the handle of the magus, the, the, the arch of the stapes, the head of the stapes, the lenticular process, the facial nerve within the facial canal, the facial recess, and the sinus tympani. 
Now, as we move down, the obstacles will start disappearing. We can very well see that we no longer see the stages. The basal term of the cochlea becomes prominent. We must start closing the promontory and the round window niche. The magus becomes converted into the handle. And because sometimes the magus can handle can be at an angle, it will be medialized. Sometimes you can see the magus handle as a steep. Very faintly, you see the interior superior joint here. That is the area of the facial nerve facial recess and the sinus tympanite again correlated on the close segment. Finally, lower down, just a little part of the tympanic of the, uh, this, this is the tympanic membrane faintly visible here, correlated here, and the lower part of the various handle, the facial nerve, recess, sinus tympanite, the promontory with the basal turn, and that is your round window niche. Now why is this segment important? This particular section becomes important for public page for, for surgeons performing the cochlear implant. You need to know how much of a window do you have between the tympanic animus and the facial nerve, because that is where you are going to perform your posterior tympanotomy. And what is the kind of overhang that you have as far as the down window niche is concerned? Finally, everything disappears, no further obstacles visible. Just the basal term of the cochlea and an empty vesicle. Right? So before I move on to the coronal sections, I would once again like to reiterate that this is one section that you should have while you are sort of interpreting a CT temporal bone. And I'm not saying that the other segments are not important. In fact, I would not be, I mean it would be However much I reiterate, it would be much, much less of it. That scans should not be read in isolation. They should be read in continuity, action superior to inferior, and parallel posterior to anterior. Don't just pick up a, an, an image and try finding your way out. There is a chance that you could make a mistake. So as you can see, it's the yellow area which indicates the facial recess, and the red arrow which indicates the sinus area. From here onwards, we move on to the parliament section. Again, it, for my, my protocol for reading the parliament sections is very simple. Go posterior to anterior again, because there is a paucity of structures posteriorly. And as you keep on moving anteriorly, it becomes more crowded. And it's easier for you to correlate the structures. Now, this is one of the most, one of the posterior scan. I and mean, I would say this is the most posterior scan, because you're not seeing the posterior canal here. That is what you would normally see on the more posterior scans. But as I mentioned, this uh, presentation is more about the ossicles. So as the ossicles start getting visible on the coronal section, what do we see first? The first thing that we see is this small pinpoint, which is the short process of the impus. Right? Because we're moving from posterior to anterior, so, so we should be expecting the short process of the impus, the body of the impus, the inguloomeriolar joint, the head of the magnus, the handle of the magnus can be a little dubious because again, as far as the angulation of the magnus is concerned, it varies and therefore you could maybe see the handle of magnus even a little earlier. Anyway, not only that, what you also see here is the round, is the oval window, the opening of the vestibule. Mind you, this is the oval window. Why? Because the round window it would be much, much inferiorly located. So this is not to be mistaken as the round window. Right? And not only that, very faintly you could make, uh, you can make out the superior, the superstructure of the stapes. Again, correlated here, the small dot that you see here is the endless short process. That's the superstructure of the stapes. That's the full plate and the opening into the vestibule. And this is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. Right? Right underneath the lateral semicircular canal. So right underneath, this is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, right underneath the lateral semicircular canal. Okay? And this, in, again, in radiology terms, is called the great hanging from a branch. Because the branch is supposed to be, the lateral semicircular canal is supposed to be the branch, and the tympanic segment is supposed to be the solitary great hanging from that branch. We move a little more anterior, right? The point becomes a little wider. It still is the short process of the impulse. The superior head becomes more prominent, as does the opening into the vestibule. 
again, correlated here. Moreover, that's the lateral semicircular canal, and that is the anterior end of the superior semicircular canal. So, so this is the lateral semicircular canal, the anterior end of the superior semicircular canal, the head of the stapes, is somewhere here. Somewhere, this is somewhere here is, is, is the thickness, and this is the tympanic uh, segment of the facial nerve. Become more anterior, and we start seeing the body of the impus. Again, because of the angulation, we see a break in between on the gross anatomy, not so much as on the actions uh, on the parallel scan. So that's the body of the impus, and if you just follow it downwards, that's the long process of the impus turning into the lenticular process and getting attached to the head of the stapes with the anterior crust here and the posterior crust there. So the same thing happens on the parallel scan. That's the body of the impus. Follow it downwards, the long process, it turns, the lenticular process, head of the stapes into the stapular joint. And this, my friends, is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve here, which you can see here on the gross section. So this is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. And now we come to another more important structure, which is better visible on a coronal scan rather than on an actual scan, and which is this one. And that is the lateral active wall or the scutum, again, more liable to erosion in localized cases of cholesterol So when you are dealing with a localized case of cholesterol you need to see whether this acute angulation between the out external auditory canal wall and the lateral wall of the attic, whether there is any erosion or not. A little more anteriorly, now this is the entire body of the acus. This is the entire body of the acus, but mind you, this is not the long process of the acus anymore. Because the moment you have the acutomalic tibial joint, the acus is over as far as the long process is concerned. It's so flimsy, right? So as you can see out from the cross, cross section, this is the body of the acus, and this is the body of the acus because you can differentiate it from the end of the malleus the moment you see the next few segments, set sections. But this, friends, is the handle of the malleus with the lateral process of the malleus embedded into the tympanic membrane. So do not mistake this shadow here as the lateral long process of the incus. So this is the body of the incus, but this is the handle of the malleus with probably the lateral process of the malleus embedded into the tympanic membrane. Now look, this is what the head of malleus looks like. Compare it with this, okay? So this is what the head of the malleus looks like, and this is the body of the indus. So this is the equilibrium the joint. So now, now again compare this. This is a bilobed appearance. So this is not just the indus, it's not just the malleus, it's the equilibrium the joint. So the bilobed appearance that you get on the coronal section of the bones in the attic is the equilibrium the joint. You can see a small dimple or a notch here. You can see a small dimple or a notch here, which corresponds to this dimple or a notch which is seen with at the joint, joint uh, interface, right? So this is the body of the anus, the head of the malleus. Now you can see the handle of the malleus well and the tympanic membrane with the lateral process of the malleus. Not only that, you see the copulary form process here and the tensor tympanite tendon coming out and attaching itself to the neck of the malleus. Not only that. You see, actually see the pars flaccida here. So this is the area of the Cusack space. So if you have a good radiologist, if you have a good CT machine, believe me, it's possible to do wonders as far as HRCT temporal bone is concerned. And why do the pictures that I'm using right now? They're almost 14 years old. I'm sure CT's uh, HRCT temporal has progressed by leaps and bounds. Anyway, so. This is where your popularly form process with the tensor tympanic muscle is. So in that case, this is your tympanic segment of the facial nerve. This is the, the lateral tympanic segment of the facial nerve. And these are the basal terms of the cochlea. Why am I paying attention to this? It's because of what I'm going to show you in the next segment. Similarly, so head of malleus, body of interest, including medial joint, lateral process of malleus, parse maxilla, tensor tympani, and we have the facial nerve over here. Right. We move more anteriorly, and now 
we see the glucose here because this is a gross section, section. so it's more three-dimensionally oriented, whereas a CT scan and HRCT is a sub one millimeter cut. So this is isolatedly the head of the malleus, whereas over here you can still see the head of the malleus to the part of the body of the impus behind. Anyway, this is the head of the malleus, again neck of malleus, the lateral process and the tympanic membrane over here and over here. You see the basal term of the cochlea and the two segments of the facial nerve that is the tympanic segment and the genital and the lateral hand segment and this in radiological terms is called the cobra head appearance. The head of a cobra with the two eyes on top and you are having a head, head on view of the cobra. The cobra is in front of you. So the coils of the, uh, the, the cochlea is the head of the cobra and the two segments of the facial nerve are the two eyes of the cobra, right? So this is the cobra head appearance of the cochlea facial nerve complex on a parallel section of HRC to temporal bone. As we move more anteriorly, the structures become lesser and lesser as far as the ossicles are concerned. The, the turns of the cochlea are visible and now what we see are the two segments of the facial nerve, the tympanic and the labyrinth gland segment, fusing together to form the geniculate ganglion. So this is the geniculate ganglion. Mind you, this is not the facial nerve, this is not one part of the facial nerve and the other part of the facial nerve. This is the two parts of the facial nerve combined together to form the geniculate ganglion, whereas this is the tensor tympani muscle and the last remnant of the head of the malleus with the rest of the tympanic membrane visible. Finally, everything disappears. Just a far ace as far as the base, as far as the turns of the cochlea are concerned, the genital ganglion, and this is the vertical part of the internal carotid artery. Nothing more to see here. As, as I said, as you move more anteriorly, the number of structures become lesser and lesser. Now, I think you would agree to me had gone anterior to posterior, it would have been a little difficult for us to identify the ossicles more so when it came to the handle of the malleus, the wrong process of the impus. And that is why my suggestion, my personal suggestion is always to come posterior to anterior. Right. Now just reiterating some final points before we go into the last part of the talk and that is the pathologies. And that is, as I mentioned, this is the body of the impus. And this is the head of the malleus. Why are they being shown side by side? Look at the long axis, the orientation of the long axis of the two structures, so that you don't make a mistake. The body of the impus, the long axis, is obliquely oriented, whereas, as far as the head of the malleus is concerned, its long axis is more vertical. So that's one important point to understand, or rather to help you differentiate between the body of the impus and the head of the malleus. The other part is this bilobe structure. Never make the mistake of considering this either as the body of the impus or solely or as the head of the malleus. This is the incudo-valular joint with the posterior superior part being the body of the impus and the anterior inferior part being the head of the malleus and the dimple indicating the junction of the interface. Finally, on sagittal sections, not many people do a sagittal section and honestly it's not much of a head, but this is the classical molar tooth appearance of the incudomalular joint on a sagittal section. That's a sagittal section of the left ear. That's the head of the magus at the handle. Body of the impus, short process of the impus, long process. So it looks like a molar tooth. So that's a classical molar tooth appearance of the sagittal section. It is helpful. You see, if you do a sagittal section and you get this appearance, at least when you go in for a surgery, you know that out of three, two of your possibles are already present. It's more of a positive value in its presence rather than its negative value in its absence, which can help you not only plan your surgery but also counsel your patient. Now, just a few slides as far as identifying certain pathologies are concerned. This is a typical case of chronic otitis media. Why I say chronic otitis media is because of the soft tissue present all around, which has led to a, a, a disarticulation between the head of the malleus and the body of the impus. 
So from our previous knowledge of what we've heard in the last 15, 20 minutes or so, we know that this is the typical ice cream cone appearance, but we can jolly well see that the ice cream cone appearance has much disarticulated because of the pathology surrounding it. Right? That's a cardinal section. This is what a localized cholesteatoma into in the cruise axis space, eroding the outer attic wall would look like, as I mentioned. Look how the blunting that we had seen on the carnal sections is lost. And not only that, the ossicles are surrounded by the pathology and there seems to be some erosion of the ossicles by secondary to the pathology. Now, you can see the tympanic membrane here. If you see the tympanic membrane here, it means you're quite far anterior, right? So you should be expecting at least the head of the magus here. But you can very well see that there is a pathology and you can just see a faint bit of some ossicle line here. So your head of magus, not only that, we are seeing the typical cobra head appearance. Are we seeing the cobra head appearance here? Yes, friends? Yes? So the turns of the cochlea, the labyrinthine segment, and the hepatic segment. So this is the cobra head appearance. So the cobra head appearance would not be associated with the ingress. So what is the possible we should have expected here? That would have been the magus, and it is eroded by the pulp. Not only that, look, this is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. Do you see any bone here? No. So probably you deal with the dehiscent facial nerve secondary to this pathology. Now this is a traumatic disarticulation. Well, the typical ice cream cone appearance is lost. That's the head of the pallus. That's the body and the short process of the interest. There is no pathology around. Not only that, there is a fracture line here. So if you look at the fracture line, you can understand this is a traumatic dislocation rather than an inflammatory dislocation secondary to a chronic otitis media and that is the area of the dislocation. Again, gross involvement, the tegmen is eroded, not only is the tegmen eroded, this is the head of the magus, right? Again the cobra head appearance, correct? The cobra head appearance, the head of the magus, in fact you can see the map here. And not the values. And, and the pathology has come out and has eroded the lateral attic wall to a gross extent. Same kind of an appearance, possibles eroded, pigment eroded, pathology, typical cobra head appearance. Now, the last part. We normally do these scans preoperatively, either for a primary patient when we are suspecting some. Uh, uh, complication or we do cases, we do the, 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 the scan in a revision case. But when you are doing the revision case, especially if the case is, I mean, if the, if the revision is for uh, for a modified radical mesterolectomy or otherwise, you need to know whether the cavity created that is good or not. And you can get evidence from the CT scan to ascertain whether the cavity created by either you or the previous surgeon is good or not. Now, this is a typical example of a good cavity. Look, this is where the facial nerve is. The facial ridge has been lowered down to a large extent. There are no unnecessary undulations in the entire cavity. I mean, you do not have a deep groove here. You'll, you'll appreciate that in the next few slides. There's no deep groove here. And the soft tissue, the compound with the metoplasty, is pretty wide. So a wide cavity with a wide compoplasty allowing good aeration. So this is an evidence of a good cavity on a CT scan. Same thing. This is a facial nerve. Now look at the sun is still alive. Probably you would have been happier if you would have flattened it out more, but can we? No. Unless and until we are doing a facial nerve decompression or unless and until we intentionally want to do a facial nerve. So this is your sinus tympani, and this is good disease clearance because postoperatively there is no postoperative appearance, there is no laziness here, no pathology here. That's your facial nerve, and look at the meatoplasty. Same thing, look at the wide meatoplasty. This is much above, much higher above. So the proximal palm bone has been removed remarkably well to give us a wide opening into the cavity. But this is a typical example of a poor cavity. Look at the left side of the scan. Look where the facial nerve is. And see how much of a bone, how much of a facial ridge has been left behind, dividing the entire cavity into two compartments. This cavity is going to be the kingdom comes unless and until you revise the surgery and bring this, bring this patient wedge down. So this is a typical example of a poor cavity. Not only that, the 
it gives you, if you are doing it as a secondary surgeon, it gives you confidence that, okay, fine, there's a decent amount of bone on top of the facial nerve that I can remove before I should expect the facial nerve. And if, if we do remove, not only that, the better I can get the good the of the cavity or not. If I do remove this bone right up to this level, this line becomes more straight. So, post-operative evaluation of CT for the surgery is, 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 is a very, very important and effective tool. Same case, look at the amount of bone that has been left behind. Look at the amount of bone that has been left behind, how a mastoid sum effect has been created here. Right? Same thing, poor cavity on a permanent section. Now I just spoke to you about remove, doing a wide cortical mastoidectomy, removing the cortical bone. Look at the amount of the cortical bone that has been left out here. This bone should not be existing. This bone should be as thin as this is and it should be ending here. So this entire triangular piece of bone is what is giving rise to a problem. Again, the mastoid reservoir or the sump effect. This also is a poor cavity. What have we been told? That if possible, make sure that the flow of the mesotypicum or the hypotypicum is in continuation with the flow of the external or the canal when you do a canal going down. But look at the hypotypicum here and look at look where the floor is and there is no important structure here. So if I were doing this surgery, I would flatten this out more. Again, this is giving rise to that final effect, which is the root cause of most of the issues as far as a weekly cavity post MRM is concerned. So that's about it as far as it's a very, very concise uh, outlook for attacks HRCT because being an osteoclastic workshop, I want to concentrate more on the hospitals and their relationship, relative relationship with the surrounding structures. HRCT, I believe, is an important tool. And I also believe that every urologist should be capable of reading these scans themselves rather than depending upon their urologist. Thank you very much.